So Sasha, yes, that was phenomenal, brother. Thank you. Dynamite, dynamite. So bef you. before we begin, tell the folks a little bit about your background. Um, I know you're from New York. You got the, the Mets hat on. But just give them a little bit about your filmmaking background so that they know. Well, I'm a second generation black filmmaker. Uh, my father was a filmmaker. So he's from Philly and my mom's from Haiti. So I like to tell people I represent the entire slavery experience. Okay. Um, so, you know, having a Caribbean background and an African-American background gives me a unique perspective, I think. Okay, cool. cool. But before so, that, I was a journalist. I wrote for Vibe magazine and blah, 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 this, that, and the third, a little here and there. Well, you kind of hold out on them a little bit, but you, you, you've done a lot. But that's, that's cool, though. I'm a man on the verge of turning 50, so, you know. Okay. Um, you know, there's some time has passed, yes. All right, for sure. So what inspired uh, you, you guys to do this documentary on uh, Rick James? Well, I'm a musician myself. And um, when I learned about uh, Rick James's whole trip to Canada, I mean, he went AWOL, as you learn in the film. And as soon as he gets off the bus, someone calls him the N-word. And these nice white individuals have his back. And it turns out to be some pretty important musicians. So he winds up having a whole life and a career in that world. And uh, you know, I like rock and roll as well, and I'm a huge Neil Young fan. So to learn that uh, Rick James and Neil Young were in a group together, I didn't really know that, and others didn't know it either. So he, to me, you look at a guy like Pharrell, and you know, for young black folks, things have opened up more because of the internet and other things. It's okay to be a little different. It's okay to like things that people might say are traditionally white, right? A guy like Pharrell epitomizes that. He's into skateboarding. He's into all these things that now, if you're a young African-American or Latino kid, it's not weird for you to have all these interests. And Rick James, to me, is someone who, was, who did that in the 60s. He was really early in terms of having a broad cultural vocabulary where he could sort of relate to lots of different people have all of these influences and create something really unique. And so in many ways, Rick James as an individual is very contemporary to where we are today. Yeah, I thought it was interesting how he, he crossed so many different genres. And he died, he died at what, like 60? 56. 56, so he was still a young man. But he crossed so many different genres and I found it really interesting that he started out as almost like a folk singer, right? Yeah, I mean, that again, he going AWOL and going to Canada, he had an interest in folk music and he wound up falling in with a group of people who were doing just that, who would wind up being, becoming very famous in yeah. their own right. Right. So what was your, your research process like uh, putting the doc together? Well, between listening to music and sort of, um, you know, having a, the team dig up all the articles and the archival and uh, books, you know, combination of reading books and articles and photography and video and talking to people who knew him, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing uh, out of the ordinary. Right. That's what you, it, this is your normal. So how long did it take? I'm going to look to Steve Revo. Round of applause for Steve Revo, our producer. <laughs> how long did it take, Steve? Twelve months. Twelve months. Look at that. That was short. That's short. Well, it takes us 12 months to get here too, right? So. What do you mean, to Martha's Vineyard? No, well, it took a couple of hours, I'm saying, as humans. Oh, okay, it yeah. It's about 12 months. So. Relatively, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Speaking yeah. of 12 months, shout out to my son and my lovely wife, uh, Raquel Cepeda, who's also a filmmaker, and my son, Marceau, who recently told his grandfather that he one day wants to be a filmmaker as well. Uh oh. So, so third, the third generation. Third generation. So, so why do you think Rick, Rick, after all his accomplishments, being in the, the indie bands, the small bands, crossing so many different genres, he, if I'm not mistaken, he's not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, right? I, I doubt it. Yeah, yeah he's not. So. Why do you think that is? I, I mean, that's a broad question. I mean, why do we think a lot of things are the way they are? Right. White supremacy. <laughs> <laughs> so he's getting hated on. Well, I, I mean, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is inducting hip-hop artists. Right. Right? And... In the process of doing all these projects, I did a, a film called Wu-Tang of, of Mikes and Men. Very good. I'm currently doing something on Louis Armstrong. You realize, or I've come to realize, there are no genres when it comes to black music. There's just 
music that's a reflection of and a reaction to pain. You know, Rick James, his mom ran numbers, right? We, do we all know what numbers is? It's like the original lottery. Well, RZA from Wu-Tang, his mother did the same thing. And Louis Armstrong caught a gun charge at 14, and when he was in reform school, that's when he really honed in his skills. So what's the difference between Louis Armstrong and RZA, who almost went to jail for attempted murder? What's the difference? It's the same thing. It's the same story told over and over again with the art and the comedy and the, the, the poetry and the music being a reflection of and a reaction to pain. Even if you're a rapper rapping about how many cars you have, it's still a reaction to figuring out who you are in America based on what you think America has told you America is supposed to be about. Mm -hmm. So that's what it is. And I've also come to realize that in many ways, hip hop has become the new cotton. The new what? The new cotton. A new cotton, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. A lot of people are picking it, but there are other people who are profiting from it. Very good. That's a very good analogy. That's a good analogy. I noticed that, um, what was I going to say? Uh, that, uh, well, I'll move on to another question. So, uh, what surprised you? That some, when you went into the documentary, you knew some things based off of um, just your love of music. But what surprised you that you learned? What, what did you learn about Rick, Rick James? Well, I, I think I've learned that people deeply loved him, but also were felt deeply scorned by him. So while band members will say, he didn't pay me, I didn't get what I deserved, they still have this deep love and respect for him, and it's more of a, they're mad at him, you know, for being, having these issues and, and leaving so soon. Mm -hmm. And while they're very angry about not being able to buy homes in Panama, right, in Florida, they miss him. Right. You know, so it's, it's a very complicated uh, sort of feeling, and to me it, it speaks to how universal he was in many ways. He was many people to many people. Mm -hmm. I noticed that, um, and I don't know if there's a correlation, but uh, that he called himself the Pied Piper of Funk, and that uh, I guess R. Kelly, I'm assuming he got that maybe from Rick James, he called himself the Pied Piper of R. No comment on R. Kelly. No comment on R. Kelly. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know anything about R. Kelly. Well, they, they both end up kind of in, in a similar situation. But I mean... So, well, they both, they, listen, both, they both call themselves the Pied Piper, and they both end up in these kind of predicaments. That's my, my opinion. Michael Jackson and R. Kelly, you know, black people, they're not going to, I don't know. Some of them aren't going to let go of that. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I mean, we all, we're all entitled to, our, uh, yeah. to, to different, different opinions. So what was Buffalo like for you? Buffalo, you know, growing up in New York, I knew nothing about Buffalo, and Buffalo is in New York. Right. Um, it's, a, you know, it's essentially a Rust Belt city. It reminds me a lot of Detroit. Um, with a lot of, at one point, there was a lot of industry, and, and there were jobs for people of color. And now, you know, as it, even back then in the film, the, that archival is from the 70s. I mean, um, there was an auto industry and a lot of other things in Buffalo that kind of went away. So... As Rick James says, it's a perfect place to cultivate arts. Because again, as I said, it's all a reflection of and a reaction to the environment. And so he went back to Buffalo after getting out of prison and wound up finding the inspiration he needed in his community to become who he became. And when you listen to his music, when you learn about who he was before, he was this rock guy, he was this, this guy, when he gets to... Um, What's the song? Why am I spacing? You and I? You and I. When he gets to that song, You and I, you hear all of the, everything that he did leading up to it. So there was a lot of math. And again, he didn't really make it until he was 30. Like, what rapper, if you didn't make it, if you don't make it by the time you're like 22 now, it's over. No rapper is going to keep rapping in their 30s. So he was really determined to make it. And that, that's something that's really, you know, respectable and you know, you, you admire people who have that kind of dexterity and determination. Mm -hmm. was, this, was this the first time you saw it in front of, with an audience? It's the first time I saw it with a black audience. Let me tell you something. It makes a difference. And you all understand and appreciate a lot of the nuance. And you all dance and clap and sing along. And that makes me feel really good. Good. Well, we did our job. Because yeah, sure. 
It's teamwork, and it makes the dream work. And Steve Revo is a fine Caucasian man. But he was my partner in this, and we worked together. And authenticity is important. And when you have someone who is of your culture in a position to really help shape it, it makes, the dif it makes a difference. And for so long, we haven't had that. Mm -hmm. And so festivals like this are very important. Round of applause for this gentleman and, oh, his, wow. and his wife. <laughs> That's about you, though. It's important. Yes, so it thank, is. thank you for continuing to cultivate that. Oh, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So, who, so update us on um, some of the family members. I, I know he had his daughter in there. We saw the son at the end. What was the, who, wh who was your toughest interview out of, out of all those folks there? Toughest? I mean, everyone was, pretty, everyone was pretty cool. You know, his brother Carmen, I did the interview, and you see on screen, his, he's tearing up. Mm -hmm. I was so in the thick of the interview, I didn't even notice that he was really emotional and, and, and uh, he was essentially crying. Um, everyone was really excited to participate in this. I didn't have any trouble. I mean, there are people we tried to get. I tried to get Neil Young. You know, uh, Rick James has another son who couldn't get him because he's in prison, in the same prison that Rick James was once in. Folsom? Yep. Wow. And Folsom's like, that's hardcore. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's like hardcore. And for him to be, for him to even, you know, come out of there and still have, have that career, that's, that's a testament to his, uh, his uh, fortitude and his determination, for sure. And Rick, you know, has, you know, he, everybody has a homeboy who's a little shady, he might sell stuff on the side, but that's the homie. You know, uh, Steve and I met with one of those gentlemen at a hotel in L.A., and he came with a briefcase, and he told us he had the best photos in the world of Rick James, and they were all, like, smudged and, like, you know, <laughs> got passed around at the party and was right. asking us for money and was weird and saying he was the only person who had these stories. And, you know, so we didn't get... What was his name again? Not O.J. It was something like something J. I don't know. We didn't get him. It's all right. No it worries. Out. No worries. No worries. Out. So what is it? What is it? I know you. You. I guess specialize in, in docs. Will you be doing uh, narratives at any point in time? <sighs> one day, one day. But right now, you know, to be a, a a a black documentary filmmaker in New York City, you know, my wife and I live in New York. Mm -hmm. You know, um, a lot of the action is in L.A. But to be able to have gigs and work in New York is a, is a blessing. So. As long as I have a job, right? It's all we try to keep a job. Right, right, right. So update us on, on the daughter. How's she doing? What's she up to? You met her. Ty James is, you know, you see her. She's, you know, keeping it tight. She's, um, she's the lead of the estate. Very active in Rick James, business, Rick James' business, which is, believe it or not, still pretty active. People license the music all the time, and there's always... Rick James, Hustle and Bustle, something for her to do. So she's pretty active. Mm -hmm. And then the son is a rapper. He's a rapper. Yeah. How will we be hearing something from him? Hopefully soon. I know he's been working on it for a while. He's working on it for a while. I've got to say. So, and what is it about the docs that, that resonate with you? Well, I was a journalist before this. Um, and I, I see it in my son. He likes to ask questions. And I like to ask questions. So I think everyone has an interesting story, how people come together, how you became you, how your parents came together, where they came from. I'm just fascinated by people, and I'm a, I have a passion for music as a, uh, being a musician myself. So knowing that uh, music is such an important intersection with culture and lifestyle and politics and identity, the marriage of telling stories and utilizing music to me is very appealing. So that's what I've been doing lately. Cool. Are you working on something right now? Mm-hmm. What are you working on? Um, I'm working on a film about Ed Sullivan. Oh, OK. Um, and how he was someone really important when it came to people who look like us getting on television and some other things. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Because I, I was thinking maybe that, you know, obviously you love music. You mentioned you as artists. I thought you would be staying in that, in that genre. but. I did a film called, it's a very strong title, Burn Motherfucker Burn, mm -hmm. about the so-called riots of Los Angeles mm -hmm. uh, in the 60s and 
someone might have seen it. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I like to tell stories, and, you know, hopefully I'll have the opportunity to tell a broad range of stories. Mm -hmm. So what were some of your takeaways from, um, from, from the Rick James, and what would you, would, you, would you want the audience to take away from the documentary? Well, going back to the you, R. Kelly, right, mentioning, right. you know, um, how do you feel in a modern context about an artist who, in real life, outside of his art, wasn't the best person, particularly with women, wasn't the best person, right? How, can you separate it? How do you process that? Um, and I think that's a very contemporary conversation right now, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's Michael Jackson or R. Kelly or, or whatever, or, or Rick James. And I felt that I couldn't do a Rick James story without showing you photos of women who he abused. And he, he himself admitted, mm -hmm. as he says in his own words, yeah, I put hands on that woman because what happened was they were all doing drugs and the woman uh, kicked her, his pregnant wife. You didn't hear him say, my pregnant wife, but that was the subtext. Like, mm -hmm. the, the woman kicked his pregnant wife, and that's when he said, I put hands on her, you know. Either way, um, you can't tell a Rick James story without getting into that kind of thing. Yeah. And it just continues the conversation for modern day folk. Some people are going to learn about Rick James who knew nothing about him. Maybe they heard his music but didn't know who he was. Now they can put two and two together and then feel how they want to feel about him. Mm -hmm. Looking back at him, do you, I mean, his, his brother had mentioned towards the end he was a bit of a, a character. Well, the skit, he said, kind of made him into a caricature. Right. But looking back at, at his career, what did, what did you think? What was your take on, on his career? Did you think that there were parts where he was somewhat of a caricature earlier than, than, the, um, than the skit? I mean, by the time you get to the Chappelle, I mean, he's, no one's checking for Rick James's new music anyway, right. you know? So, again, the way culture works now and the internet works now, I mean, that show is almost 15, 16, however many years old. Mm -hmm. If that show would have come out now, it would have been way more huge than it was, you know? But it was a lifeline for him at that point, because he, you know, as his, as his manager said, people wanted a crazy Rick James. And when he wasn't crazy, it wasn't good enough. So he wasn't getting work. So the thing that spoke to the crazy Rick James that everyone knew was, I'm Rick James, bitch. Right. So it kept the lights on, right? And some of his friends said at the end of the day, he didn't feel so good about it at the end. But maybe he had no other choice. Right. It's weird. It's like, like after all he did, he's kind of known for I'm Rick James, bitch. You know, it's, just, it's just bizarre. Right. And it's but, almost unfair. Right. But when you see him in the studio uh, working with the Mary Jane girl, I mean, those songs are hits. Yes. Yeah. You know, people forget. Yeah, that's they, what I'm saying. It's unfair that, that people would just know him as that from that, from that, he's kind of remembered just from that skit, you know. But he's also remembered for burning women with crack pipes. Yeah. So yeah. that doesn't help. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. So where, so where are you, where do you, and I, it doesn't matter this way or that way, it's an excellent piece, but I just want to know where do you stand on him as a human being? Brilliant musician, flawed human being. Right, right. Um, do the math. At the beginning of the film, right, you learn about his early experiences, and right. I'm saying experiences as I covered my son's ears and, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. You saw the film, you saw what happened to him at a very young age. Mm -hmm. So think about that, right? Think about what he's exposed to at a young age, and then think about what his exploits are with women, mm -hmm. what he's doing. It shapes his whole, his whole career, basically. I mean, he, he, it's laid out for you in the film, mm -hmm. right? Now, I'm not saying you should feel differently about him. I'm saying, here's this information. Here's this information that might inform you on who he became. Who he became was not the best. But this might be the reason why. Right. And so maybe you might be able to say to yourself, I respect him as an artist. He wasn't the best person. I understand why these things, he, why he did these things, and I feel sorry for him, or I understand why he did these things, and I still don't feel sorry for him. Right. 
but at least you have the ability to do the math based on all the the numbers that add up at the very end of the film. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like how you added the animation to the piece. Could you elaborate on the animation a little bit? It was diff It was a different. I know there's different types of animation, but you can elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean Hector Arias is a cool Dominican brother who I've worked with on multiple projects, and you know he's a hip hop guy and. I think he's very creative. And the style that he did is very sort of early 90s video game. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. some people don't dig it, but I think it has a unique homemade character to it that in some ways is kind of funny, in other ways it kind of serious. You know, it's, it's a tricky balance with Rick James because mm -hmm. he's also very funny. You got a lot, a lot of laughs I, from, the whole, from the audience. I, were you surprised at that? It's a black audience. <laughs> I felt like I was at the Apollo. <laughs> Sandman's going to come out. It must have bring about no, too but, soon. but because this is a part of the culture, humor, which is also a reflection of and a reaction to pain, right? Mm -hmm. He's got it, and he's quick, right? So. You've got to, when you think talking about Rick James, you have to take all of these things into account. He's juggling. He's juggling. He can do music. He can, he can sell you drugs. He can make you laugh. Mm -hmm. He can wear crazy shit that you never would wear. You mm -hmm. know, he can do all of these. He can have braids at a time when no one would do that. And that's the other interesting thing. Like, he meets an African woman on an airplane and says, I like that. Give that to me. Right. And what, what did that mean for, for, uh, black identity mm -hmm. in a popular music context. You know, this isn't Bo Derek. This is a black man wearing braids, mm -hmm. which wasn't very common with African Americans. So in his own way, like you learn early on, he was trying to be in this African cultural group. He had some consciousness. You know, his, his lyrics, you know, um, street, street songs, that album, was, you know, Ice Cube himself says, before I did F the Police, he did that long Mr. before Mr. me, and right. that was an influence. Mm -hmm. Ice Cube is telling you this. Mm -hmm. You know, so he had an influence and an impact that people didn't realize. And I think that's, you know, one of the, the goals of the film is to share that information, but give you a real balanced picture of who he was. Mm -hmm. Now, Tina Marie... Um, I wish she could have, I wish she, she was still, she wasn't alive, obviously. No. Right. Um, but she's definitely one of my, my favorite artists. How many, just question, a lot of black people in the audience, do you all consider her a black woman? Oh. <laughs> let me say, let me say myself, I think, and I'm probably wrong, and I'm sure they'll correct me, but I think she is an extremely unsung uh, artist in the in the R and B African American genre, without a doubt. Well, obviously she's not a black woman. I know that. She's I'm not. not. That, I'm not that crazy. But everyone who knew her said that she was authentically something. Right. That didn't make them feel. It wasn't a Dolezal situation. A what? Dolezal. I got I got a different opinion on that too. But go ahead. On Dolezal? Yeah, I do. What's that? If she can do the job, let her do the job. What, as an NAACP yeah, person? Yeah, let her do the job. If she's doing a good job, let her do the job. But we, I don't want to get into that, though. That's my opinion. And y'all might disagree. So I don't, and, and as, as he said, I don't care. But go ahead. Go ahead on Tina Marie. She was very soulful, yeah. I think she was like the first, and I'm probably wrong, she was like the first uh, female rapper on... On, on Square Biz, on uh, Recorded Rapper. That's my opinion. I'm probably wrong, but she was like one of the first, if not, if not the first. Yeah. She's not credited. She doesn't get credit for that, for that verse on, on Soul, right. Square Biz. And Blondie might have been around the same time. Uh, what'd you say? Yeah. Yeah, they kind of smash up against each other. Yeah. yeah. But she was dope, though. Black people like Tina Marie. That's it. Yeah, she's dope. She's dope. Now, now here, here's what I want to ask. Has anybody in here seen Rick James live? Oh, okay. Whoa. Okay. How, anybody seen Tina Marie live? Wow. Okay. Good for you guys. I wish I could have saw him live. 
How about you? Nah, uh, nah, nah. nah. I'm a little young. Okay, all right. Well, I'm a little old too. Okay. Well, this was a phenomenal piece, brother. We, we loved it. Uh, it was dynamite, without a doubt. Give him a round of applause, y'all. Thank you. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be on Showtime. It's going to be on Showtime September 3rd. Tell your friends. Tell your friends. Showtime September 3rd. Bitchin'. Once again, Mr. Shas Sasa Jenkins. Thank you.